Welcome to ZRT Insights. I'm Dr. Elise Schroeder, and with me today is Dr. David Zava, President of ZRT Laboratory. So let me take a moment to introduce Dr. Zava. In addition to being a president here at ZRT, he's an internationally known speaker and a leading expert in hormone health. After graduating with a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Tennessee in 1974, Dr. Zava pursued his interests in cancer research, and over the past 25 years, he's published extensively on basic and clinical research relating to the effects of estrogen and progesterone on breast cancer. He developed saliva testing and established ZRT Laboratory as a simple, non-invasive means to test hormones and hormonal risk for breast cancer. And today, Dr. Zava will be talking about iodine and its role in human health and also how to best test for sufficiency. Iodine deficiency is a worldwide health problem, and there's an estimated 2 billion people suffering from low iodine levels. Since iodine is essential for the formation of thyroid hormones and for brain development in utero, iodine deficiency can have some serious health effects. Severe iodine deficiency can result in mental retardation, while less severe deficiencies can affect normal growth and brain development in children. In adults, iodine deficiency can result in thyroid dysfunction and an increased risk for formation of goiters, hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism, and papillary cancer. Today, Dr. Zava will discuss the role of iodine in physiology and testing methods to monitor levels. Welcome to ZRT Insights, Dr. Zava. Thanks to have uh, to be with us today. Thank you very much. I'm very excited to be able to talk to everyone about uh, iodine. Um, it's a special interest to me uh, because, of course, we we look at thyroid hormones and iodine is, is uh, essential for uh, the the formation of, of thyroid hormones, uh, and it's essential for life, as you all know. Uh, if you don't have thyroid hormones, you, you couldn't survive. So iodine being a, an essential component of the thyroid hormones is, is, a, is a very important element uh, in the periodic table of elements uh, that we should study. It's interesting that iodine is the largest of the, of the elements in the periodic table uh, that is uh, present in, um, in uh, different types of, of things like, like thyroid hormones. It, it is the very largest of the, of the elements. Um, this is a very complicated slide that I, I just want to go over very, very quickly to give you some thyroid hormone synthesis from iodine. Um, iodine is taken up by the thyroid um, and it's taken up by um, what's called the, the sodium iodide symporter you see over here. So this is this would be the, the follicular cells, the uh, thyrocytes of the of the thyroid gland. And the brown staining you see here is the staining for the uh, sodium iodide symporter. And this allows the iodine to be concentrated, the symporter allows the iodine to be concentrated within the, the thyroid gland. There it's taken up, uh, it's combined with a protein called uh, thyroglobulin. Thyroglobulin is only produced in the in the thyroid, uh, nowhere else in the body. So it takes thyroglobulin, uh, iodine, uh, along with uh, peroxide, and this enzyme called uh, peroxidase, thyroid peroxidase, uh, will link the, the iodine to the thyroglobulin. So there's a whole lot of that reaction going on within the thyroid gland. So it's it's manufacturing, it's placing the the iodine onto onto the tyrosine residues of the thyroid glycolin, which has a lot of tyrosine residues in it. So it'll continue to, uh, to add the iodine. You end up with uh, monoiodotyrosine, diiodotyrosine. This then is, uh, this complex is then stored in the lumen of the, of the thyroid gland. Um, and when it's needed, it's, it's taken back up into the thyroid cell and digested. And this is a very simple, um, explanation for everything that's going on, but the proteases, the lysosomal proteases, break it down, and eventually uh, end, you end up with the thyroid hormones, T3 and T4, uh, and these are then released from the thyroid into the bloodstream. So that that's a very simple explanation for something that's very complex that's going on within the thyroid. But as you can see, uh, iodine is, uh, is essential for, for that for that uh, formation of, of thyroid hormones. 
to the sodium iodide and simp order, a lot of things that control that, one of which is, is uh, uh, thyroid stimulating hormone that's coming from the brain. There are a lot of things in, in that you uh, expose yourself to from, from diets, dietary foodstuffs to pesticides and herbicides and some medications that have uh, what we call goitrogenic actions and that, that means that uh, it uh, prevents the iodine from uh, attaching to the uh, tyrosine and the formation of thyroid hormone. So these, an explanation of goitrogen is anything that inhibits the ability of the thyroid to utilize iodine to manufacture thyroid hormones. Uh, they can have different mechanisms of action but they're generally present in dietary foodstuffs such as soy, cruciferous vegetables, all those things that we know are good for us, but also too much of them can, can prevent iodine from um, being utilized to form thyroid hormones. Uh, pesticides, petrochemicals, some uh, medications like lithium also uh, prevent the uptake. So here you can see it's, it, it happens at different places. Uh, thiocyanate, which comes out of cruciferous vegetables, and things of that nature um, can block the, the uptake of iodine uh, by the symporter. Um, isoflavones um, that would come from, for example, soy can block the peroxidase, so it prevents the iodine from being attached to thyroglobulin. Uh, propofol uracil um, also is blocking the peroxidase. So these are different things. Some are medicines, some are, are present in, in foodstuffs that are uh, preventing iodine from uh, attaching to the thyroglobulin so that you can form thyroid hormone. In areas of the world where iodine is deficient, uh, the, the effects of isoflavones and, and thiocyanates and things like, like that are, are more significant and can be more problematic. In places like the United States, it's not really that problematic that you'd eat soy foods or that you would eat um, cruciferous vegetables. And these are just some different types of goitrogens, the sulfated organics, the isothiocyanates, the flavonoids. That's just about everything you, you know, that you get in those foodstuffs. Uh, phenols, the, a number of different things that uh, you can see. Uh, one type of uh, uh, the thiocyanates that are present in some staples of, of uh, foods in, in areas of Africa, such as cassava, um, actually, I bought some cassava chips at Whole Foods the other night just to see, just to see what they looked like. But uh, you can get this in, you know, in foods. It's not that it's a bad thing. It's just that it uh, it's present and it does have goitrogenic activity in areas of the world like Africa where you have a, uh, an iodine deficiency. You combine that um, cassava with an iodine deficiency, then you can really start having problems. Of, of uh, iodine deficiency disorders. So what are the consequences of, of low iodine um, uh, in the fetus, you know, in the unborn, in the neonate, the child, and the adult? Because there can be differences in um, each, each of these groups. So iodine deficiency in the fetus, if it's a very uh, severe deficiency less than, and, and urinary levels are less than 25 micrograms of iodine per day, can result in miscarriages, stillbirths, uh, congenital anomalies such as cretinism. You can see the, the two people up here in the, in the top slide uh, both suffer from cretinism. Uh, brain damage, mental retardation, increased perinatal mor morbidity, mortality, and it's been said that uh, moms who are iron deficient, uh, their, their offspring may lose as much as uh, 10 to 15 IQ points uh, on, on birth. And that, that they live with the rest of their lives. So important that um, I think for pregnant mothers to have adequate levels of iron. 